Hi, everyone. This is Carol Hinkle. We're delighted to have you with us today. This is our second lecture of the fall series already. A couple things. I just wanted to remind you that CCTV is partnering with us this year to showcase our wonderful lectures, and we thank them. Please check the emails we send out to you the Thursday before and look for information on how you might be able to, to help them out and send a donation to them. We would love that. Also a reminder to please access your Q&A button on your screen. You can touch the screen and that Q&A button should come up. Please tap, tap it, type in your questions anytime during the lecture, even during the Q&A uh, period. So we'd love to have your input. So now I would love to introduce to you our own Michael Orlansky, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much, Carol. And today we're pleased to welcome Brian Pete. He is the Chief of Police in Montpelier, Vermont. Chief Pete leads a dedicated police department of 27 full-time members. This department provides wide-ranging services to residents, workers, and visitors to our state's capital city, which has a daytime population of more than 20,000 people. Before coming to Vermont, Brian Pete served as Chief of Police in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Before that, he had a long record of service in the Chicago Police Department, which is the second largest municipal police department in the United States. Among his positions at the CPD were patrolman, field training officer, and chief forensic audit investigator for public safety and police accountability in the city of Chicago's Inspector General's office. Chief Pete also had extensive service in the United States Air Force as an aircraft maintenance officer and later in senior operational and investigative positions in federal law enforcement. He served in Afghanistan, coordinating US and Afghan forces in counterterrorism, intelligence, and force protection missions. Brian Pete earned a bachelor's degree in sociology at Southern Illinois University with emphasis on employment relations, and he earned a master's degree in police psychology at Adler University in Chicago. The title of today's talk is The Future of Policing, Strategic Planning for Community Safety and Partnership. Please join me in giving a warm Tripoli welcome to Chief Brian Pete. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Michael and Carol, for that. I, I, I am excited and I'm extraordinarily honored to be here. Um, I really, again, appreciate uh, this privilege. Um, my hope is just to provide um, my perspective on a very significant issue, which is, of course, policing right now in today's day and age with everything that has gone on from our profession and a focus on where our profession can go in the future, realizing that we have to know where we've been um, before we can continue to chart out uh, what the future will be. So the, again, my intent is to, uh, to give personal insight and opinion as to our profession and, um, and again, just to look to move forward. And I'm hoping that this is a, a good discussion between all of us, a very honest and candid discussion, because I'm also looking for your feedback and your ideas and input, um, because it's not our profession that determines where we're gonna go. It's the people within our communities that let us know what they demand and what they expect from us. And that's, that's our North Star, that's our compass and where we wanna go. So I'd like to share my screen and, uh, look at it. Um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation um, going. I just want to know, can, can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay. And I will. All right. And again, my name is Brian. I'm with the Montpelier Police Department. Um, the breaking it up, of course, into numbers, the threes, uh, what I'd like to discuss in regarding strategic planning for community safety and partnership and how we move into 21st century policing is to talk about where we've been, the origins of policing, uh, to talk about where we are, the current state of policing, and the future where we can go from here. 
So what I'm what the origins that I'm going to talk about the research points come from uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Gary Potter. Uh, Gary Potter, I'm sorry, and and Dr. Potter, I believe, is the uh, is a professor at Eastern Kentucky University, and he's been in the news a lot um, uh, lately regarding policing, where policing has been from, um, and and because he's done a lot of research in the topic, and there are going to be some folks, um, there are some people that are out there um, that look at what his research were uh, was, and they will say, well, policing didn't stem from that. And some folks who are going to take it and say, yes, it actually did. Um, but I think there's in getting away from the politics and getting away from the, from the chaff is, is to, to determine what in the research that we can take away as a profession, as a community, as a nation and, and, and learn from and build on. So those are going to be the primary things that I'm, I'd like to focus on. So according to Dr. Potter, um, you had, uh, in looking at policing and, and what started it out, there were two primary paths, one in the North and one in the South. So in the North, there was uh, something that was called the Night Watch. And that started in Boston in 19, or in 1636, uh, New York in 1658 in Philly. And it was composed of volunteers, folks who who were, you know, eh, according to Dr. Potter, were, you know, sometimes they were a little mischievous, sometimes they were a little drunk at night, they fell asleep a lot at their posts, um, they were trying to avoid service within the military. Um, so you had a group, and, and their primary charge was to keep the community safe when it was dark, to keep an eye out who needed help if they saw trouble coming uh, to alert the rest of the community. But that evolved into more of a constable form, and then, uh, then it finalized into uh, uh, police agencies who were paid with taxpayer funding uh, to provide safety to the communities. And the first uh, police agencies were Boston, Albany, New York, and Chicago, and that was from the mid-1800s. And then the second pathway was in the Carolina co colonies in the South. And Dr. Potter says that that started with slave patrols, and they had three primary focuses. That was to apprehend and return slaves to push back and prevent slave results, uh, revolts, and then to discipline slaves. So the big thing here, we can agree or anyone or, or, or the conversations that are happening out there within the community regarding policing in the past um, on, on what that evolution is. But unique to the conversations, the arguments out there, the information's out there. And one of the things I'm gonna hit on the most is perception and legitimacy with policing. And that's where our past is. There is a tie to that past with policing. And for me, that the common denominator and, and understanding and acknowledging that, the common denominator has to be in moving forward is uh, what I've learned is the definitions and the, the responsibilities, the roles, just like anything else, any other profession, um, anywhere else that we are in, in history, it's defined by what the norms are, what the current pulse of society is at the time. So my take uh, on that is um, that priorities are strongly influenced by societal norms. Um, even, even in the past, there were, uh, when policing first started in the 1830s and the 40s, society was grappling with should police have use of force? What is the appropriate amount of use of force? And that's, that's amazing because that's where we still are right now, which will bring me to another recurrent theme. Have we learned anything from the past? And if we did, my argument is that we wouldn't be in the same situation that we are 100 years, you know, since 100 years has passed. Um, so, um, with this, um, with, with the use of force and with societal norms, uh, Potter had, had noted that, uh, and I'll go ahead and just read it, is because the police were primarily engaged in enforcing public order laws against gambling and drunkenness, surveilling immigrants and free slaves, and harassing labor unions, public opinion favored towards restrictions in the use of force. Makes a lot of sense to me, because the police were involved or involved themselves. Um, and, and again, it, it could be a sense of sign at the time, but I think leadership stems from a courage of conviction. And, and we were involved in political 
influences. We were involved in, in, in case systems. We were involved in haves versus have nots. And, and, and what were we enforcing? What were we doing? And that goes back to that whole perception in the beginning. We're enforcing slavery. If we're enforcing anything that's going to push back against somebody's human rights, there's always going to be, there's going to be an upheaval. There's going to be a, re a revolt. And have we learned anything from going there? So again, the whole point in this is to know where you've been so you know where you're going. And, um, and what this courage of leadership is and what our department and, and moving it up to modern times now, our department, our profession has to have leadership abilities. It has to have a courage of conviction. It has to have a courage to say, we are going to push ourselves away from political influences and we're going to focus on what we're supposed to be doing, what we're sworn to do is to protect people, to keep people safe and, and not to be whims of anything else. And we can't do anything that's going to erode the public trust in us. We cannot do anything that's going to promote an us versus them. And, and that's, that's where we're at. And, and, and it's, I think it's heightened even now more than ever. And we have to push back against that. And, and the essence of service of what police departments should be doing is there's a, there's a discussion within policing right now. You have a warrior mentality and you have a guardian mentality. And a warrior mentality says, we're military, we're gonna go out and there's the enemy. We have to defeat the enemy. We have to defeat crime. There's a war on crime. We have to be prepared to deal with that. And then there's a guardian mentality that says that we are charged to, to make sure that we keep our community safe, that we look out for the interest of everyone within the community. And there are times that one may, if there is a, a life or death struggle, that you may have to revert to a, a warrior mentality. But not everyone we meet on the street is deserving of a warrior mentality. We don't have to look at everybody suspiciously. And so when we look at things like um, how we, we train in the future, um, uh, the, the different things that we're doing for ongoing training, for continued certification. Is our training getting in the way of being part of the community that we're sworn to protect? So the current state of policing right now, um, of course, what we're looking at is, or what we're dealing with is what happened in Minneapolis, George Floyd. And, and, and in that murder, that stemmed uh, civil unrest all across the country and all across the nation even. And Vermont was not exempt from this, uh, even here in Montpelier, which is where that image is, the demonstrations. And you had police agencies and self-included grappling, just, just begging for positive news, for glimmers of hope that gave more of, of the stories that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that talked about who we, who we feel we are in, in doing the jobs and in, in answering what we call a calling, a, a purpose, a meaning, and they weren't coming. And, and there were even times that I was watching things in the news that I just, I looked back and I'm like, you know, my wife is sitting next to me and she's like, I really hate the cops. And it's like, yeah, me too. It's like, what is going on? And um, so, so there was a lot of desperation there. And, and then uh, these events spiraled up from people who said that they supported the police to the events in January, uh, on January 6th at the, at the US Capitol. And on top of that, law enforcement was still struggling and dealing with the norm, unfortunate, of day-to-day -day tragedies of mass shootings, domestic violence, homicides, and, and, and other violent crimes. And then the other tasking that we found ourselves dealing with in a post 9-11 era is dealing with terrorism, but not just foreign, point right back to, to January 6th, to, uh, to domestic terrorism. So ultimately in talking about our past and where we've been in the past, those who have, you know, who don't know history, they're, they're doomed to repeat it. So have we learned anything? Will we learn anything now? And that's the big question. And, and my argument is thus far, we haven't learned anything as, as, as a profession because we're still here. It's still cyclical. So uh, the changes that are revolving around accountability, police accountability in George Floyd. Um, uh, it, I'm gonna talk a little about something, a little bit about something called the Ferguson effect. 
And this is something that's been uh, coined in law enforcement circles and research circles, uh, even on, in the media. Uh, so in 2014, Michael Brown was in Ferguson, Missouri. He was killed by a police officer um, uh, re revolving an incident where he was suspected of, of, of stealing. And uh, there, was, there was an extraordinary amount of, of scrutiny that law enforcement found. And there were, and it was, there were political elements to it. And of course, there are criminal elements to it, as there should be. But a lot of law enforcement folks felt that it's, a, it's I have no support. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be the next uh, viral sensation. I don't want to be the next person on YouTube. I don't want to be the next person to be arrested. So there is a perception that law enforcement, and I would argue that it's true that law enforcement has stepped back. And in some places it's worse than others, but law enforcement kind of stepped back and said, we don't want to cause any waves. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get arrested. Or leadership might be saying, uh, oh, we can't do that. We, we don't want to be in trouble. I don't want to step into anything. So police dial back a little bit. Now, whether that leads to increased crime, um, don't know. Uh, uh, but, but the perceptions, again, we have to deal with perceptions as they are reality because that's how people see things. So this Ferguson effect is what we're looking at now and how that brought us to, that it, that it became even more significant after George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. Uh, and then again, the increased uh, civil unrest, the demonstrations, Black Lives Matter, which was founded in 2013, had become more prominent um, there were more calls for civilian oversight to defund police agencies, uh, school resource officers, because of, uh, because of brand, if you will, um, because of reputation, because of perception. Uh, police officers, uh, police agencies were looked at with hyper scrutiny. And, and whether or not police agencies should be existing in the first place. And then there were calls to uh, increase policing you know, on, the, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum. And then, then, then there's the middle. What do, what are our good jobs or what are the responsibilities that police officers should be dealing with rather than being having this ever increasing mission creep that if there are other social agencies that are not being funded or other mandates that are coming down from whether it's a state or a national government that will ultimately fall on police agencies because for the most, unfortunately, our society is currently kind of conditioned to call 911 for everything. And is it appropriate for the police to be responding to every call for service? We've seen, uh, it's been a longstanding trend that um, cities and municipalities have been sued for um, use of force for civil rights violations. And now we're starting to see trends where cities are being sued for inadequate protections, arguably because of the Ferguson effect. Law enforcement not going out there and getting and, and doing what they're what they're supposed to do, and and, and again that 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 is a manifestation of what I believe is this us versus them mentality, that it's society is against us, or the police are against society that they're sworn to protect, and it's going to take it's going to take strong courage and conviction to push back against that. So in looking back again to um, to narratives and to transparency. Um, has anyone ever heard of the phase, please unmute yourselves if you can, uh, hands up, don't shoot. Well, so, so hands up, don't shoot came out of, out of the incident with Michael Brown. There was a witness to, uh, uh, to, to the interaction that Michael Brown had with the officer. And according to that witness that he said Michael Brown was yelling at the police officer, hands up, don't shoot, don't shoot. And there are, there's information out there that says that wasn't true, that the findings were that, no, that never didn't in fact happen. But that narrative prevailed, that per perception prevailed um, to serve and protect. So now, even now, folks are looking at police officers and like, is that what, what you really do? Is, is that what you, what you meant to do? So there's another issue that police officers have with this whole, you know, um, thinking back to the older uh, uh, law enforcement cartoons and police shows about, you know, nothing but the facts, ma'am, and just this very cold fact finding kind of a mission, a uh, very un unapproachable, um, and a lot of law enforcement agencies popularizing this no comment, no comment. Well, in absence 
of communications with the, with the communities that we serve. We allow a narrative to come up. And in an absence of that information, that perception, that narrative becomes true. And we have to, to be trustworthy. We have to um, communicate. We have to immerse ourselves in the community and we have to regain legitimacy. And what is legitimacy? Uh, legitimacy, in starting with this conversation, what gives me the right to pull you over? If you're driving along the street and, and you look up and you see those blue lights and your heart kind of sinks, you're like, oh, what's going on now? And you see those blue lights behind you. What gives me the authority to pull you over? And we could argue that it's the law. We could argue that, um, that it's, a, it's a municipal ordinance. Well, that's what I've been trying to do. That's what I always do. Well, well the truth of reality is um, what, what makes you stop is you. You don't have to stop. And, and, and this is the definition of legitimacy. It's respect worthiness. And I'm using a definition of a really good one that I found was the Rand Corporation uh, and when they're doing the research on legitimacy policing. It's, it's that police officers need to be seen as trustworthy, unbiased, neutral. It's you have to earn the respect. That's what, that's what gets people to pull you off. That's what gets people to stop when you ask them, please stop, may I ask you a question? Uh, when you're interacting with people, no one gives you authority as a police, a police agency. You have to earn it. And that, that comes into another concept called the Pelian principles of law enforcement. Um, but that's a whole nother, uh, whole, whole nother discussion. But it talks about the community is the police and the police is the community. It talks about re-engaging with the police. It, that's where we come from. And that's where we have to remember uh, a humanization, if you will. So in this whole crisis that we were dealing with within our profession, um, we had pretty much two agencies, two types of police agencies, agencies that had legitimacy, um, but it, we, we were all hard hit. And, and, and those of us who, who had built up credit with our communities, um, we still were looked at with, with hyper scrutiny. We were still looked at that, hey, what are you doing uh, to make sure that you're not like the other communities that we're seeing on TV? So we're, we're, we're using every bit of credit we got to say, no, no, that's not us. We're not like Minneapolis. We're not like Chicago. We're not, you know, so you're going out there and you're, you're pretty much anybody that will hear you, you're, you're, you're pleading and you're begging, but you got some, some money in the bank. You've got some legitimacy built up that people are giving us the benefit of the doubt. And then you might have another department who may not have immersed themselves within their community, who may not have taken the time to communicate, to be transparent, to hold themselves accountable when something happened. And those are some of the agencies that are struggling with a lot of things right now. Consent decrees, civil lawsuits, um, that's where we're at. Uh, so, um, and, and as, a, as, a, as a total profession, um, we've all been damaged because of this, and I'm not saying it's because of something we didn't do, it's the reckoning that we're dealing with as a profession. And we've been damaged by that because we can't even recruit and retain officers or attract people to our profession anymore. And I consider that is, is a failure on leadership and as our profession, because again, did we know where we came from? And did we take steps to keep this stuff from happening? Why is it always a pendulum swinging? Why is it always cyclical? So I will start and just, you know, kind of ask, um, you, know, you know, as like an exercise in talking about defining um, um, or perception. Uh, so a lot of police officers will complain about, hey, are we getting a fair shake in community? Um, we can look at what the media's role is in, in telling a story and, and, and media wants to sell a story. Um, but internally, again, what did we do to push back against what we, what many of us consider a false narrative? And I think that's where a, a huge mistake um, in, in what we've done with. So with this exercise, let's talk about the thin blue line, the blue line flag. Um, the blue line flag, uh, it's it, what, what the blue line flag itself was created in 2014 by a college student uh, to show support for law enforcement. Um, 
the blue line with then depending on the circles of law enforcement, it's pride. It is kinship. Um, it is just a dedication to our community. It's a dedication to our profession. And it's a calling. It's a service. It's noble. It's honorable. Um, it's a rallying cry. Um, but the narrative has changed in certain places that now um, possibly depending on the community that the blue line might represent something else. So that narrative that's been allowed that, you know, we, that it was initially started out to be something that was supposed to be more positive in some circles are being seen as more of a negative thing. So with the same discussion, there are certain people in the community that feel that they can't raise the American flag because they'll get, there's, there's a negative connotation to it um, that they don't want to be associated with, uh, you know, again, I don't, I'm trying, not trying to jump into politics, but like conversation out there, I don't want to be accused of a Trump supporter or people who are, who are claiming to push American ideals. Let's go with January 6th, people waving the American flag, but at the same time storming the nation's capital. Um, so that, that contradiction in terms, but the American flag to me means something that I've given a lot for in my service to the country and my service um, in the Air Force and my service as a law enforcement officer. 9-11 um, just happened, but there are media stories and pushes out there that talk about this narrative. Um, is it a progressive thing that only that progressives, uh, people who are democratic or, 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 or demo, uh Democrats or progressives, they don't like the American flag. What's that narrative? Um, so then you have other narratives that, you know, like even here in Barrie, there are discussions locally about why didn't Barrie City endorse to fly the flag on 9-11? Is it political? What is it? I don't want to get into the politics. I'm just bringing up the whole point of perception and the whole point of what narrative do we allow ourselves um, to have in moving forward? So again, part of this last exercise, I'd like to ask to each of you all, when you see this personally, what does it mean to you? Some folks, it means, it means support, it means solidarity, it means empathy, it means understanding the plight. And other folks may see it entirely different. And then when you add the component of um, LGG, uh, LGBTQ um, plus, now what does it mean? So all of our experiences mean something to everyone. And again, ultimately, what have we in, as law enforcement leaders learned about it? So in Vermont, um, to really briefly discuss uh, some nationwide trends. So these are some numbers that came out through the uh, commissioner's office a few months ago. And on this chart, you'll see the number of law enforcement officers leaving uh, Vermont. Uh, has vastly outpaced newly or, or hired, newly hired or newly certified officers. Uh, the forecast for full-term uh, full time officers in the coming years will show far fewer than what the departments are self-reporting in 2021. So, you know, departments are being optimistic, but statistics are showing that we're going to fall short. Is this um, a, a product of the Ferguson effect? A lot of people getting out of the, um, the profession altogether. Uh, we have slide, the, this slide here talks about respondent staffing totals, um, and we're looking at right now that um, available officers are down 14% um, when you compare it to a three-year average, that people that are leaving this profession as soon as they can, or they're not even waiting for, well, you know, there's folks that are saying, I'm waiting for my pension, and, and, and some folks like, I, I don't care, I'm leaving now. Um, Looking at this particular slide here, it talks about the attrition for the year. And you'll see here that uh, folks who have separated and folks who have resigned and retired, what that difference is, where we are in 2021 compared to the first three years, um, uh, compared to 2018 to 2020. This next slide here talks about full-time officers in Vermont, self-projection and what the um, uh, what the state projects and states looking at it, uh, we're, we're being positive. We think we're going to come up and that's why we've got the blue dotted line and the red dotted line says uh, figures are showing more of a downward trend. And then this last slide here 
uh, gives an idea as to how many folks who are graduating are scheduled to graduate from the Vermont Police Academy versus the attrition for officers this year. And it's projected, we're looking at, uh, this was a couple months ago, they've just uh, brought a new academy to start here in October, but without that academy, it was projected for about 160 officers to leave this year and compared to only 23 coming into the profession throughout the state of Vermont. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I've been through a couple places and, and, and what I've seen in going through the training of Vermont, I think it's very trauma and victim informed. I think there is a huge emphasis in, in training in Vermont to, to weed out an us versus them mentality, to talk about um, working within the community. That's been my experience since I've been here. And I've seen other places that, 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 that weren't so conducive to that 21st century style of policing. Um, but I haven't seen significant information that suggests that Vermont has an issue of, of sustained significant patterns of, of systemic issues within the police culture. Have there been officers and staff members who have done criminal acts and who are not worthy to wear the uniform or the badge that I wear? Abs absolutely, absolutely. But as far as sustained constant incidences that have been going on, Vermont is not necessarily in the news as much as other states, other municipalities um, have been. Um, looking at January 6, 2021, um, Montpelier Police Department itself, uh, we've uh, looking at, based on domestic um, violence, or I'm sorry, uh, domestic violence uh, um, elements that are in the country right now, especially what's going on, um, we've assessed our threat level within the city of Montpelier is elevated. Um, looking, and, and these are some of the challenges, again, that we're facing as we're dealing with this reduced staffing. Um, the CDC has just come out uh, with uh, overdose uh, fatality data, and there has been na nationwide an increase of about 30%. In Vermont, uh, OD fatalities have gone up nearly 60%, and that means that Vermont has the largest increase percentage in the United States. So Vermont is dealing with, again, another opioid crisis um, and an uptick. Uh, we anticipate upticks in domestic violence-related incidents, um, uh, violence to, to, to children. And this is something that we've historically been seeing. And have we prepared ourselves for it? You know, are we ready to deal with this as we're coming out of this? And, and what in, in, in the, the last bullet, foreign domestic, uh, foreign terrorism and influence, and you know, on, on civil unrest, what makes me personally upset about this is our communities need us. And as leaders, have we done everything that we could have done to prevent it from getting to this point? So real quickly, where can we go from here? Um, we, we're waiting for current uh, um, strategic plans or, or recommendations from community groups. There's an overwhelming desire here in Montpelier to reimmerse into the community, to regain that trust. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking to try to do is to rebuild our legitimacy, to put that credit back into the bank, to provide training and resources, to protect against the trends, the, the, the trends and the threats that we see, and to look at intelligence-led policing so that and, and to have a victim-informed policing style. Um, we look at how do we take care of our officers and our staff, how do we strengthen their resiliency and their resolve. Um, and how do we increase morale? And where we can go from here, it's no secret sauce in training. We treat people the way we're supposed to be treated. And it's nothing but organizational psychology. So in organizational psychology, it's um, uh, you ID training and development needs. You design optim optimized work and quality of life. You formulate and implement training procedures. You just move forward. We also ask the questions, what should police be responding to? We're real with expectations internally and externally. We try to stay away from the generalizations, too much at stake. And we have to have, we have, to have the courage of conviction um, to stand up to things that are not just on either side, whether it's something going on internally or whether the police departments are being called historically to enforce things that we should not be enforcing. We look at um, civilian oversight and that we have to train our leaderships. We have to get them involved. We have to do succession planning. 
So one of my favorite quotes, leadership to the um, leadership at the highest levels, you know, John, uh, not necessarily, I'm not trying to preach everybody, but John 8, 30, uh, 32, the truth shall, shall set you free. But Ben Stone, Law and Order season one, but it always, but it won't always make you happy. So uh, with that, I thank you all again for this opportunity uh, to be here. Um, and, uh, and I hope I didn't make too many people upset but uh, I, I am ready for any questions or any comment that I can give. All right, um, thank you, Chief Pete. We have a, a large number of questions from our uh, members and guests. So let's, um, let's get right uh, to that. One questioner asks, what ideas do you have for recruiting and retaining police officers? I think our, I think that what we need now more than ever with what society is is looking for with the huge demand of 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 justice of social justice of 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 treating everybody with dignity and respect is to tap into that and to to define our profession to saying that there's no more noble way to give back to your community and to come in here and the, the best way to fix any broken system is to be part of the repair of that system. And I think that we need to tap on that energy and challenge folks, challenge young people to come in here to bring that, um, that culture to our profession. Thank you. Uh, another questioner asks, how many of your staff are on patrol? And how do you determine how many should be on patrol for each shift and where? So there are certain formulas and certain companies that look for call for volume or, or calls for service. You look at that, the, the data points, how long it takes to deal with a call for service, the, the more routine types of call for service. And then it looks at safety parameters and how many officers sh should be there. Um, so so there's, a, there's a formula, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's math. But when you're dealing with human dynamics, it's not always the same. So for our staff, we have um, 17 sworn, including myself. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question there? Um, the officers on patrol and when, and when and who? So, so unfortunately, it's, you, you, we have to guide ourselves with data and we have to guide ourselves with common sense. So the FBI does have, um, 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 they do give statistics on what the averages are. Now, those are just the averages. It's not necessarily what everyone needs. So there may be some communities that, that, that have arguably more police officers than they do, uh, than, they, than they actually need. But uh, in looking at those studies and looking at what the demands of the community are, um, I think that data and hard figures are, are, are a very good starting point in, in answering calls for service. Okay. Um, what were some of the most interesting topics that you studied in your graduate program in police psychology, <laughs> it was um, it was it was uh, uh, it was resiliency, and it was how 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 law enforcement has a has a knack for siloing itself off from first from our own family and friends. Um, well, first from our community, then our own family and friends, and then it kind of leads into a downward spiral because there's a lot of negative uh, stuff out there. And then I was extraordinarily upset with how law enforcement dealt with um, folks who are dealing with um, some very stressful situations. And it was the old mentality of, you know, get up, dust yourself off and get back out there to work, rub some dirt on it and you'll be fine, um, which, which makes law enforcement. And, and sometimes in, in a lot of cultures that's still prevalent, which leads to increases in suicides, divorce rates, um, health issues. There are a lot of police officers that die um, only a year or two right after they retire. Okay. One questioner asks about whether it's possible to set up a cyber task force in Vermont, a cybersecurity task force. I think it's absolutely possible. Um, what uh, I'm going out on a limb here, um, Vermont has very limited resources. It's a small state. Um, Chicago had more people in, in my old city than, than the entire state combined. But since it's a smaller state, we have smaller resources. We have smaller, you know, we have people who aren't trained in as many things and we can't rely on the state police to do everything for us. So I think that we, we should look at different ways of regionalizing our resources, pulling our sources together, whether it's through a county system or whether it's through a Northern, Central or Southern part of the state. Um, 
and then looking at that because every time that we're ignoring things like that, like cybercrime, that whether it's we're looking at human trafficking or whether we're looking at people who are are losing their their savings account uh, um, because of cybercrime, it, it's something that we should be focusing on. But there's a way to do it. We just have to make sure that we do it. Okay. Have you ever been involved in a hostage situation? If so, how did you and your colleagues handle it? Oh, <laughs> so hostage situation, I think that that, um, and, and not looking at a hostage situation in the terms of um, like, like the old, like, like TV shows where you have uh, one person, you have a bad guy here and you have one person here and they're held at gunpoint. Um, uh, not many of those, I, there have been those situations. But um, other situations in which there, you might be dealing with a family member who might be holding an infant, I've been in, in some of those, um, and they're in a, in a very uh, angry crisis or criminal state, um, and dealing with that, it's extraordinarily scary. And um, it, uh, it's just finding a way to communicate with that person, to bring that person down, and not acting emotionally, and, and not overhyping or, or escalating that situation. Is your department responsible for any state government buildings or events? Technically, uh, technically, we should not be. Um, however, anything that within the state um, follow falls anything here within um, Montpelier, any call for service for assistance, we're going to be the first ones to respond. And, and if it's a more of a drawn out event, then the state police may step in to deal with the situation. But um, so we do respond to it to provide that mutual assistance, but even though these are more or less state resources. Okay, thank you. Um, one questioner would like to know about um, whether police work and firefighting work, uh, why it seems to run in families. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I, 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 I don't know. It might be something in the blood, but, but, but it, it might have something to do with influences as, as young folks. Cause I, I'll tell you that, um, that, that my mother was a police officer. Then my father was an electrician from Northwestern railroad. And, uh, and then he, uh, left that job and he became a police officer in Chicago. And then I became a police officer in Chicago. And then my brother became a police officer in Chicago. Um, so I, I think we're, what it used to be back in the, um, for, for folks here with more life experience, the, the concentration was more and less, um, set yourself up for financial freedom and get a job that gives you a pension. And then, so that's what kind of drew folks into that. But then uh, now I got my daughter walking around the house with uh, my hat on and, and uh, wanting to ride in the police car. And it, it kind of scares me. <laughs> so unfortunately it might, it might run based on that, uh, that influence. Okay, um, one questioner asks, uh, asks this. I understand that all new police officers who are hired by Evermont Town are trained at the police academy. Who determined the style, method, or culture of that training? Do poor practice actions of local officers arise from police academy training or other lack of training? Um, so, so, so basically the criminal justice, it used to be the criminal justice and training council, um, sets the parameters for, uh, for, for training and what's required. The state also has some mandated training that officers must complete to be certified. Um, but as far as the, uh, uh, as far as the, um, um, you know, so it, there, there are just universally accepted standards and as far as what policing is going. Uh, goes through. I, I think that we need to have more time at the academy, um, but but lessons learned are the culture is set by the staff, and and in some places um, you'll get somebody who goes to the academy. You come out bright eyed and bushy tailed. You ready to take on the world. You're going to make a difference. And the first thing that the the next cop, the grizzled cop, tells you on when you hit the street is. Everything they taught you in the academy, forget about it because that ain't true. Let me tell you what the real life is, what the real street is. And that right there just throws everything that the, that the academy has been trying to build up on culture. I have not seen that in Vermont. Um, I've seen the academy pushing that and I've seen when folks have gotten to their, uh, to their departments that they're like, oh yes, you will do this. This is what Vermont is. And I think a lot of that is also baked into the law and what officers can or can't do, especially when we talk about lodging or arresting people. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that um, 
and, and as far as our training, it's peppered with mistakes and with criminal actions of what other law enforcement officers within the state and across the country have done. There's so many highlight reels that we watch um, on how not to do it. Okay, the next question is about community outreach. Do you reach out to communities and go door to door and introduce yourselves? Door to door, I can't, uh, because depending on the calls for service or the other requirements that I might have to do, the administrative requirements, uh, yes, do, uh, I, I, I don't do that. Do I do, uh, do I walk around Main Street and State Street? Uh, go to as many, I'll go wherever. If somebody calls me over and says, hey, I got three people coming over, can you come over and, and I wanna talk to you about your department? Well, guess where Brian's gonna be at at that date and time? So I think that we, we, we have to make ourselves available as much as possible. And that um, again, law enforcement has historically be, been seen as very unapproachable, even, even internally. You know, that's the ivory tower, is what, what, what a lot of places call it. Um, we have to be approachable to our, to our um, staff members as well as to our community. Okay. Um, one question has, uh, has this, are you deploying mental health professionals in Montpelier? Oh, yes. So, so we, uh, so my predecessor, Tony Fakus, um, and Chief Bombardier and Barry had, uh, and Washington County Mental Health Services had, uh, had got together, pulled some resources, and now there is a, a social worker who, who, who separates her time half in Barry, half in Montpelier. And in Montpelier, right now, we've just stood up what's called a crisis intervention team program. And we have a CI, that's CIT, and we just created a CIT steering committee with NAMI, with uh, um, the psychiatric survivors, with Kareem, um, Dr. Mark Detman from the hospital. Uh, so we, we have stakeholders that, that form this, what this response uh, model should look like when we're, dealing, when we're working with people who are in mental health crisis and looking for ways to divert away from the criminal justice system and towards help for their families as well, for whatever support network they have, and then with an emphasis on sanctity of life and preservation of life. Okay, I have a question regarding, is the Black Lives Matter BLM movement or organization involved in crime prevention and assistance involving suspects of color? I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm not sure necessarily that the answer to that question. I can say that I've, I've reached out to some folks, me personally, I've reached out to some folks um, that I understood to be uh, with BML or BLM, um, but mm -hmm. I've gotten no, um, no response back because I, I'm looking to partner. I'm looking to find out what we need to do right and what are the values of our community and how do I implement those values here. Okay. Um, what skills would you like to have in the Montpelier Police Department? Uh, empathy. Um, competence, life experience, and, uh, and, and um, just uh, an overwhelming desire to, to, to give back to their community. Okay. Can you tell us please, um, what do you like most about be being the police chief and what do you like the least? Uh, the hours, the work, I'd say uh, at least in dealing with um, unfortunate situations, whether it's internally, or whether it, it in seeing people in, um, in families at their worst days. That's hard. Um, but uh, uh, what, what, I, what I like most about it is to be in the position to, to help people. Um, that, that's my high, and that's, well, that's one of my reasons for living. Okay. In the uh, training process, is there psychological testing of potential police officers? to demonstrate their mental stability? Yes, there is. So uh, it's required from the state of Vermont to take the MMPI. I can't remember what the, the Minnesota, uh, I can't remember what else, the personality uh, inventory, I can't remember, but the MMPI too is required um, uh, for here. And, and in Montpelier, we've, we've actually upped the ante with that one. And we have another system that we've brought on board called Critical Hire. And Critical Hire is uh, it's another, um, psychological based profile that helps us when after, after folks take the test, whether they fall in areas that have historically had problems with authority uh, complaints from the community. So we add the two together and that gives us a very good tool bag and what we need to do as far as um, um, polygraph testing and how we structure our interviews. One questioner asks, why do you think Vermont's increase in opiate addiction is the highest in the country? Uh, I, 
I, whew, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the only thing I can do is speculate. I think that Vermont is more of a rural town and there may be, um, uh, I, I may not want to touch that one, but I think that, you know, because there's, there's rural, there's more isolation, um, um, you know, and then, then looking at all, all the, uh, the mental health issues that we're all grappling with right now, um, with COVID, uh, depression and coming out of it and actually, and then going back into it again. Um, I think that uh, folks are just feeling desperate. Sure. How do you coordinate with other police departments when necessary? Become friends with them, uh, put ego aside, um, and uh, and uh, and that that it's not that remembering where we are and what we're here for. Um, so uh, just becoming friends with my fellow chiefs, uh, with my fellow law enforcement officers. Um, and then instilling that trust. And then when one of us has a good idea, all the rest of us jump in to do it. Are there ways in your view that policing in Vermont is different from other places where you've worked? Absolutely. Give you an example. Um, there was, there was, there was a, one of the first calls I came into was um, there was a person who had committed a homicide. Um, and, um, and I come from Chicago. And, <laughs> and Chicago's under a consent decree. And, uh, and, and this individual, the, how the state police were, were speaking with this person and how uh, the other law enforcement agencies that came in were speaking to this person were, were far, uh, were, were more empathetic and more personal, even though this person had just done something dreadful. Um, it was more humanistic than it was in other places that I've been in. Um, one, uh, one more question just came in. Do you have uh, visibility into a potential recruits background for those recruits that have uh, prior policing experience? So, yes. So, so there are two things. There's a, the NDI, which is the national, um, there's a national database index that the federal government has that looks at why officers, if somebody who has been a previous law enforcement officer, they've been decertified. They, um, but it's one of those voluntary systems that you have to volunteer to be part of, and then you would put that input in. And then I could, if I knew that somebody came from the Memphis Police Department, if they're in the NDI, I can look them up and say, oh, that person resigned under investigation or was, you know, kicked out or lost their certification. Um, Vermont just passed a law uh, making it a, a mandatory requirement that officers are support that if we, if, if someone is, you know, we're recruiting someone or someone wants to join our ranks and they're, they're private. Our, our prior law enforcement service, that they have to give us access to all their records. In some places, in some states, the only thing that the agency is required to do is to say, yeah, they worked here from this state to this state. That's all I can tell you. Um, but Vermont took it a step further. And, and if that person refuses to, to turn over that information to give it to us, we cannot hire them. Okay. Um, in Vermont, the concept of school resource officers, that is placing uniformed police officers in public schools has sometimes been controversial. In your view, how have uh, SROs, school resource officers, worked out? I'm sorry, how have they been? Yeah, what, what is your view of the, the school resource officer position? It's, um, we, I, I've heard various um, points of view as to whether it is a good thing or not to have uniformed police officers in, in public schools. I, I think that first, I think that it's a sad, sad place that we have to have, we even have to consider having law enforcement officers in a school with children. Um, the second part of it is though, I think that some of the reputation and some of the things that we've done in our profession in the past um, make it difficult to get that legitimacy and to earn that trust with some of the communities. But I've seen more often uh, good than bad coming out of school resource officer positions because the type of people who are put into those roles traditionally are people who, are, who really care and who are really good with children. And it's another layer uh, to be able to, to get people and to get families help because sometimes, um, uh, you know, kids don't wanna go to, to teachers. Kids don't wanna go to, to the counselors. Sometimes that SRO may be the difference. It may be that another person that can help them dealing with something that they're dealing with. And another one of the good things about an SRO position is if I've dealt with a family that had a significant domestic violence issue the prior night, um, I could let the SR, SRO know who could in turn go to the school and say, John or Susan had a really traumatic incident last night and we need to focus our efforts and rally around him or her. This may be the last question we'll have time for. Um, 
as the chief of police, do you have a daily routine? Uh, is there such a thing as a typical day at work? No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's administrative, it's meetings. Um, and it's, it's just trying to get in everything I can, squeeze in everything I possibly can within the day. Um, uh, maybe time for one more. What is the relationship between um, the, your police department and the Vermont State Police? Um, could you tell us uh, a bit about that? Who asked that question? <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I, I kid. I, I think that the uh, I think that the I think that we have a very good working relationship with the uh, with the Vermont State Police, and I, I think that um, uh, Vermont State Police is, uh, is is overtaxed and a lot, and they have they have um, they, they're struggling with, uh, with 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 bringing staff aboard as well. So I think that we have a very good strong relationship, and that we're um, we're mutually supportive of each other. And, and, and I think uh, a, a huge example of that is what happened on January 6th and then January 17th and 22nd when we uh, came together to uh, protect the state capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Carol? Yes, Brian, thank you so much. Montpelier is very lucky to have you. We really, really appreciate your hour with us. Thank you. See you all next week.